Shut it, man! You know, brothers, it's no secret that the greatest things in wrestling have elements that are borrowed from others. Be that Waylon Mercy and Bray Wyatt, or Nature Boy Buddy Rogers and Ric Flair. Hell, even the Hawk has some elements that are borrowed from Hulk Hogan. I don't know if the Shove It Squad can quite believe that or not, though. You all need to put some respect on the Hawk's name, and by default, you should also put some respect on Hulk Hogan's name. So in today's video, I plan on showing some respect to the inspiration of Hawk Hogan. No, it's not Wes Briscoe, that's never happening. No, no, it's Hulk Hogan's TNA run. Okay, it might be hard to be respectful during this video because it's Hulk Hogan in TNA. I mean, it speaks for itself, doesn't it? But what was he actually up to? What did he actually do on screen? What was the point in him? All that will be answered and more in today's video as we look at what Hulk Hogan got up to on screen in TNA. To start the conversation about Hulk Hogan in TNA, we actually have to rewind back further than expected to 2003. This is just after his WWE run where he left because he wanted more money. About this time, Hogan was still just about in ring shape here. For what it's worth, I feel like he's not exactly been in peak ring shape the entire time of being a wrestling fan. But he was wrestling over in Japan. Over in TNA, things weren't going well because the NWA heavyweight champion was... A wild slap nuts appears. Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Slappy was looking for opponents and he made contact with Hulk. Slapnuts invaded Japan and during a Hulk Hogan press conference he whacked him with a guitar. This was supposed to open up the door for a TNA main event of Bound for Glory but it never happened because Hogan had too many injuries. Despite that it didn't stop Hogan's name being constantly mentioned on TNA programming. It never led anywhere and Hogan was back in WWE shortly after. It's unknown what the long term plan would have been with Jarrett vs Hogan. I expect it would have just been a short term thing to draw eyes to the TNA product. Because let me tell you brothers, there's no way the Hulkster was going to appear full time in the TNA Asylum with the chair boy, David Young and V Infuso Jr. The TNA product thrived for the next few years and this was the glory years of the company, especially 2007 and 2008. It was genuinely admired and looked at as the alternative to WWE like AEW is nowadays. It was clearly the second biggest promotion in the western wrestling world. The problem is TNA could never seem to grow their audience, they hit a glass ceiling. Every week they got a 1.1 and it rarely went up or down. It didn't really change for three years, but speaking of change... Hogan got back in slightly better ring shape and he was over in Australia in 2009 wrestling against Ric Flair on the Hulkamania tour. The tour was a failure and the DVD footage never got released. Hogan was bored and needed something else to do. Spike TV struck a deal with Hogan and it was officially announced that he'd signed with TNA in October 2009. And the announcement of his signing was made at Madison Square Gardens just to stick it to Vince and WWE. Hogan announced that he'd make his TNA debut at the start of 2010 as TNA went head to head with WWE. Before Hogan made his debut in TNA, the product constantly mentioned him, with other wrestlers in the commentary team gloating about the signing of the Hulkster. A lot of the wrestlers worried about who he'd be bringing in with him though, and they were right to worry. I never really worked with Hulk Hogan that much. I don't know him that well. I know you guys did in WCW. What can you tell me about the Hulk? You mean personally? Yeah, personally. Well, Mick, I didn't date him. I don't know anything about personally, but as far as business yeah, goes, yeah, business. we're in the NWO, man. We're a band of thieves. Hogan is a master manipulator. I tell you what, these young punks have no idea the storm on the horizon. Who would he bring with him? Who do I look like? Nostradamus? I can't see in the future. I have no. I can't predict the future. I have no idea what you're talking about. Who said he was coming in with somebody? Kevin. If Kevin said that. It's gotta be true, he does not lie. Thank do you, you really want me to do this just like you gave it to me? Cause yes. there's only one F in Mafia. Well you can put the F where the sun don't shine. Fans of this channel will know the 2010 beginnings of Hogan and TNA pretty well at this point. Hell, I made an entire four hour video on the failed TNA Monday Night Wars with the WWE, so I won't dwell on that part too long. On the very first episode, Hogan's buddies Hall, Nash and X-Pac wanted to reform the band, but Hogan said no. It was a slightly confusing time because Hogan and Bischoff crapped on everything TNA had done up to this point, but they were still massively cheered. Or I should say Hogan was, it probably wasn't for Bischoff, was it? He took on a general management role in TNA. I guess you could say he was more of a tweener, whilst Bischoff, his partner, was the flat-out heel of the connection. The other thing Hogan did straight away that rubbed TNA fans the wrong way was calling the six-sided ring a playpen and saying they were going to four sides. TNA fans detested this decision as the fans kicked off at Genesis 2010. Welcome to the brand new Impact Zone, guys. And this is just the beginning. This is the, just the beginning of the change here. I got one thing to say about 
six sides, you had it, and it only got you so far. Now we're taking you all the way, Jack. No more eight sides, no more six sides, no more stinking playpen rings. This is where we shed our blood sets and tears, and we're changing it whether you like it or not. What you gonna do, Vince McMahon, now that TNA is coming for you, brother? 2010 was full of bad things for Hogan, and it didn't take long for another to come along. It all started when Hogan gave his Hall of Fame wrestling ring to the idiot Abyss. The monster Abyss was TNA's version of Mick Foley or Kane. He was known for his hardcore matches and intimidating presence, but by 2010 he turned into a bit of a... an idiot, I guess. The ring was supposed to give him belief in himself, but it just came across as the ring was supposed to give him superpowers, and this angle has been called the Abyssomania. This led to Hogan's first match in TNA, as him and Abyss took on Styles and Flair. AJ was doing a fake Nature Boy gimmick at this time because he wasn't deemed good enough. The match from Hogan's perspective wasn't anything to write home about. He mostly just brawled around the outside of the ring with Flair, with both men bleeding heavily. Hogan and Abyss won the match, we move on. So the Monster Abyss now had Hulk Hogan's full endorsement and Abyss started going out to Hogan's music and acting like him. It didn't work and after a couple of months Abyss finished dead last in a fan poll and the idea was canned. Abyss turned on Hogan and completely destroyed him. He wanted to kill him. There was no way that a swerve could possibly be coming at this point. Abyss revealed that he was being controlled by a Hauer power. Around this time the plan was to have a match between Abyss and Hogan. Hogan reportedly pushed for the match but in the end it didn't happen due to Hogan's back problems. Meanwhile, Abyss was on a rampage and he ended up attacking TNA owner Dixie Carter. She wanted him fired and asked Bischoff and Hogan to draw up a contract to fire him. Dixie signed the contract like a complete idiot, she didn't even read it. At Bound for Glory, Jeff Hardy turned heel and Hogan helped him capture the world title and it was revealed that Abyss was being controlled by this new group. I get that wrestling's fake and stupid sometimes, but you can't tell me Abyss was faking his beatdown of Hulk Hogan just a couple of months earlier, just to keep up appearances. It's so stupid, he almost killed the Hulkster. So now, not only does Hulk Hogan have his new faction called Immortal, but it also turned out that the contract they had Dixie signed to Fire Abyss was actually signing TNA Control over to him. What the fuck? How stupid could this woman be? And in what world can you sign over an entire company to someone with just one signature? I can barely take a dump these days without someone asking me about it. So now Hogan was a proper heel of his rip-off NWA 2.0 faction called Immortal. And let me tell you, brother, this dragged on for ages and ages. But some of you may not know what happened with Hogan in TNA next. 2010 has been done to death, and yes, he hired a lot of old pointless guys. The Monday Night Wars and Abyssomania. But let's see what he got up to after 2010. This is focusing on what he did on camera. Despite Hogan's big Spike TV contract, he was not on TV every week, and Eric Bischoff took charge on the weeks he wasn't on the show. And let me tell you, Jack, these weeks made me miss Hogan. Dixie Carter returned and said she was taking Hogan to court, and this meant he was off TV for a couple of months. By the start of 2011, Hogan had somehow won the court battle, and the ownership of TNA was now under no doubts. How did he get the judge to make that call? Immortal was still dragging on, but the members of the faction got worse. Hogan got involved in the main event at Hardcore Justice 2011, trying to bring a chair into the match. Angle took it away from him and used it on the Stinger to gain the world title. This is relevant because it sets up Hogan's second TNA match. This whole storyline has basically been an extremely slow burn because Sting has been saying for over a year that Dixie shouldn't trust Hogan and that he had this planned all along. This story arc was clever, but it's an example of a story just taking too long to play out. So Sting was going to be the TNA hero and help Dixie Carter. This feud has mixed opinions, but if you ask me it was entertaining. Sting had been pretty stale for a couple of years at this point, and acting as the Joker going up against an evil Hulk Hogan made for high entertainment. Hogan's next task was dealing with a network representative who was bossing him around. It was revealed to be a returning Mick Foley, but then the storyline was dropped after just a few weeks as Foley left the company. Dealing with Hogan and Bischoff every week slowly sent the sting around the bend. He'd been dealing with them for so long that he finally lost it. He attacked Hogan in his office and covered them with face paint and Joker Sting was born. Hogan seemed genuinely terrified as Sting was batshit. It was TV that you just couldn't look away from. Sting was determined to bring the real Hulk Hogan back through a series of bizarre attacks. Sting proved he'd completely lost it when he had a real Hawk guard Eric Bischoff in his office. Look at it hopping around on his desk. Bischoff's terrified. 
He eventually riled the Hulkster up just enough to get him to agree to a match with the TNA ownership on the line. Funny moment here because Hogan acted like he didn't mean to say it. He could have just taken back what he said, but I guess there's a no take backs rule in TNA. You have crossed the line. You've ruined everything in this wrestling business. I am so sick of you. I can't stand you. Hell no, I'll never wrestle you. But you push me. So if you want to fight, I'll fight you, Stinger. If you can beat me, I'll give the company back to you and Dixie Carter. Got what I wanted, Tata, for now. So the match was scheduled for Bound for Glory 2011. It was in Philly. The crowd were into it. If it was any other wrestlers having this match, it would have sucked. It was slow and boring, but I love this match. Hogan controlled the crowd and shows why he's the man in this wrestling business. In a similar way to how Hogan vs The Rock should have gone on last that night at WrestleMania, so should this. Also in a very similar vein to the WrestleMania match, Hogan was supposed to be a heel, but the crowd wouldn't let that happen. Sting made Hogan submit to the Scorpion Deathlock. The match sucked, but it was match of the night at the same time, and overall this was a very fitting way for Hulk Hogan's wrestling career to end, with his final match on TV at a pay-per-view going out against the Stinger. What's strange is this wasn't billed as his final match. He eventually had two more matches in England, with his final match coming in Manchester, but we'll come back to that. So Hogan was now a good guy, and he helped Sting beat up his former Immortal faction, and Dixie got a company back in a wrestling match. Lawyers couldn't do it, but wrestling could. Around this time, Hogan signed a new contract extension, so he wasn't going anywhere for a while. So at the start of 2012, Hogan had two matches on a random UK tour in Nottingham and then finally in Manchester. This is his real final match in wrestling, a six-man tag. It was him, Storm and Sting versus Rude, Bully Ray and Kurt Angle. It's certain that those in attendance that night did not realise they were witnessing wrestling history in the final match of a wrestling legend. It certainly wasn't planned by the Hulk himself as his final match. Hogan was all over the UK 2012 tour and I'm sure this was a driving factor behind the big attendances. He didn't actually wrestle on TV during the tour but he did cut a lot of promos. It was during this tour that he was revealed as the secret personal trainer of ugh, Garrett Bischoff who was feuding with his dad. During this promo he suggested that Garrett was the future of wrestling. The crowd booed. Even the Hulk couldn't get the people to cheer this scrub. There was supposed to be a match here with Hogan and Garrett taking on Bischoff and Flair in a cage, but unfortunately that never happened, because that would have been hilarious. Less than three months after Sting had gotten the company back for Dixie, Hogan was being put back in a management role, because I guess stealing a company and making the owner look like a complete fool was apparently a good credential for a future manager. He mostly gave his opinions on things while sounding like the oldest man in the world. If Steiner was there then, I'm sure he would have called him an old bastard. One notable thing that happened here was Hogan's involvement in a new concept called Option C. This is where the holder of the X Division title could trade it in for a shot at the world title once a year at Destination X. Austin Aries was the first man to do it and he won the world title for it. All things considered, he had some pretty good stuff with the Hulkster. Now from one good thing to one bad thing, enter Brooke Hogan. Urgh. Nepotism struck once again in TNA as Hulk used his position of power to bring his talentless daughter into the company. She couldn't act and sounded extremely wooden. Her official job title was Knockouts Consultant. What the hell was she going to consult them about? She doesn't know how to wrestle. It's here that the Aces and Eights storyline started out and Hogan had a lot of involvement in this storyline. Aces and Eights were a mass biker faction, but the gimmick here was nobody was supposed to know who they were and they were supposed to be a massive threat. Unfortunately, it was poorly booked and they only seemed like a big threat for the first few months. The TNA roster were pretty much useless against them at first and it all looked set for Hogan to become the hero. Where the TNA wrestlers failed, Hogan was able to somehow use some sort of mystical power to ensure that the Aces and Eights members ran directly into his fists. It got to the point where it was just ridiculous. It looked so fake and unbelievable. It got to the point where I was saying, screw the TNA roster, just let Hogan face them all in a giant handicap match. He'll probably be able to beat them. Hogan was booked so strongly against them, which was weird considering he wasn't really a wrestler anymore. Other than Sting, he actually looked like the most credible threat to bring down the Aces and Eights, and this devalued the whole TNA roster. They were pushing Hogan so hard on you, you had to believe he was going to be wrestling again soon in a big blow-off match. But it was well known at this time that Hogan's back was in pieces. This made the whole thing a bitter pill to swallow. Eventually, Hogan was written off TV to undergo surgery for his back as the Aces and Eights took him out. But luckily for us, there was still a Hogan on TV as his daughter Brooke was on screen. She was in charge of the knockouts, making all the decisions that mattered, and falling over. When the Hulkster returned from back surgery, a storyline started where Brooke was dating Bully Ray, who had been seen making good progress as a singles wrestler. Hogan was of course dead against Brooke dating Bully Ray, 
He said he didn't want his daughter to be around wrestlers, yet he brought her into TNA. What an idiot. Hogan went into a fit of rage and suspended Bully from TNA. The whole show turned into the Hulk Hogan show with promos dominated by Hogan and his stupid daughter arguing. Bully eventually won Hulk's trust after helping him deal with the Aces and Eights and helping save Brooke from a kidnapping. Check this game out, it's a lot of fun! Let's play! <laughs> if you ever look at my daughter again, I'll cut your stinking heart out and feed it to my damn dog! This led to Bully and Brooke's wedding. This was actually a good segment. You had Brooke desperately wanting her dad to attend the wedding and give Bully his approval and she kept crying and looking at the entrance ramp. Eventually the Hulkster appeared and the place erupted. This led to best man Taz turning and revealing himself to be a member of the Aces and Eights and then a mass beatdown happened to ruin the wedding. Along with Mary and Hulk Hogan's daughter, Bully was getting endorsed by the icon Sting. The tide was surely turning for Bully Ray. Now he had Hogan's full trust and with the Aces and Eights seemingly unstoppable, Hogan turned to Bully Ray for support. He awarded him a shot at Jeff Hardy's world title on pay-per-view. Bully Ray won the match after revealing that he too was a member of the Aces and Eights. The whole thing made Hogan look a bit silly, but it was the one time in TNA where he did look silly and showed weakness. He did put someone else over here if you think about it. It was a pretty good reveal in what was a storyline that I didn't rate overall. Hogan of course blamed Sting for this and they bickered amongst themselves for a while. The whole plan here was that Hulk Hogan was going to defend his daughter's honour and have a match against Bully Ray for the world title with Hulk coming out victorious. The TNA fans would have been rioting in the streets of Wolverhampton. Can you imagine if Hulk Hogan had made himself the TNA champion in 2013? Jesus Christ. Hogan would have come full circle by doing this. He would have beat the Aces and Eights on his own, taught Bully Ray a lesson and proved to his daughter what a great dad he was. The match could never take place due to Hulk Hogan's injuries and Sting took his place in the match. But this isn't a story about Steve Board and all the Aces and Eights, so they can shove it. So that was the only other major storyline he was involved with, but he still had time to sneak in some mini feuds. Whilst the Aces and Eights were starting to tail off around the end, Hogan entered a very random feud with Matt Morgan. The giant Matt Morgan had several chances in TNA to be a main eventer, but not much had come of any of these opportunities. Morgan left the company for a few years, but now he was back. Morgan now had a beard and a vendetta against Hogan and the TNA management for how he'd been treated over the years. Morgan even visited Hogan's beach shop and stole Hogan's magical robe. Morgan started wearing this robe to the ring and mocking the Hulkster. Matt Morgan then offered to take care of Hogan's Aces and Eights problems. All Morgan asked for was to be named the number one contender for the world title in exchange. Seemed pretty fair to me. But against all logic and like a complete idiot, Hogan rejected Morgan's request to help him and take out the Aces and Eights. All of that, despite TNA being ruined for two years and being harassed and ruined with countless wrestlers put on the injured list because of this group. He's trying to help you, you dumbass. Accept his help. Eventually, Morgan faced Sting for the number one contendership, and just like always, Morgan lost and disappeared from the main event scene. Nothing ever came of this mini feud with Hogan. Around this time, the internet was rife with rumours of TNA being in financial trouble, but they still had a very strong roster at the end of 2013. Dixie Carter started to become overbearing in TNA as her Dixieland stable was emerging and going against AJ. She was on screen every week talking nonsense. Hulk Hogan said that Dixie was drunk with power and he'd never seen anyone act like her before. Dixie wanted Hogan to ride the Dixie train and tried to buy him off with a second-hand watch from Argos. Hulk wasn't impressed, but he did say it was more than Bischoff ever gave him. When they get drunk with power, it just doesn't end well. After 35 years, I didn't think anybody could be worse than Bischoff. But you know what? She is. She is worse than Bischoff. He never gave me anything. Dixie backed Hogan into a corner and said that she wanted them to become a wrestling power couple, though I'm not sure if she meant sexually. She demanded an answer, but Hulk turned her down and told her that he quit. As Hogan stormed up the ramp, Dixie chased after him, begging and pleading. She then started grabbing his arms as Hulk looked annoyed for real. Then she grabbed his leg and he shuffled along like a crab trying to escape from a seagull on Burnham on Sea Beach at high tide. He kept telling her no and she fell to her knees watching the Hulk walk out of TNA. This moment right here. There's something about this moment. As a TNA fan from the beginning, this moment hit me at the time, and it still does today. From the early days of TNA when they almost went out of business, to the shove Sportsnet's days when the company was young and promising. 2007-2009 to 2009 when the company was better than the WWE. 
Hell, even 2010 to 2013 had a very strong roster of wrestlers you wanted to see. Amongst all the nonsense, there were still good matches going on. The Hulkster joining TNA was supposed to be the start of TNA pushing on, breaking through that glass ceiling and becoming mainstream. It felt like they had a chance to be more. But this moment, something died in me here. The boss of the company that I love is pleading on national TV for Hulk Hogan to stay. It was pathetic, there's no other way to describe it. It felt like all my hope and optimism for TNA drained away right at this moment. They were never going to succeed and the only way was down. Within two years, AJ Styles, Sting, Daniels, Kaz, Bully Ray, Devon, Austin Aries, Taz, Samoa Joe, Matt Morgan, Homicide, The Pope, Magnus, Hex Guerrero. All these guys who'd been big parts of the show for many years would now be gone. And within three years, the last hangers on also went. TNA changed its name to Impact Wrestling and gravitated to worse and worse TV networks. Only the name TNA is dead, but the company isn't, but it might as well be. The current Impact Wrestling product feels nothing like the old one. It's completely different, and I don't think they're proud of their past. It's not the same show. For a man who was no longer a wrestler and didn't help build the company, it sure felt like the end of the show when he left. I can't quite figure out why I feel this way. I knew it was game over at the time watching it. Perhaps it was known that a company with a boss willing to beg on our knees on national TV and look so stupid was never going to succeed. This for me was the moment where the light bulb switched on, and I wasn't even a big fan of Hulk Hogan in TNA. It's more about what this represented. For me, TNA died here. Look, Hogan in TNA was not all bad. He would have wrestled in the ring more if he could have. 2010 aside, I think there was some effort on his part. There were some bad decisions, sure, but Buddy Ray did well out of Hulk. Austin Aries did well out of Hulk. The Stinger's career was given a lifeline through Hulk. James Storm, Bobby Roode, Austin Aries, Chris Sabin. They all won the world title during his time here. 2010 may have started out like the old boys club, but it didn't stay that way. Most of those guys were gone in a few months. The problem was it was like the same old Hulk Hogan and no one really knew what to do with him. Because you can't build a feud up because you can't have him wrestling. They made him a general manager. What else could they do? At the end of the day, it's Hulk Hogan. They were always going to plaster him all over the show. And I'm sure TNA were excited to have him. Do I look back on his run fondly? No, not really, because I know what it represents and where it leads. 2010 Hulk Hogan truly did suck. The rest of the time, there was some effort to see. There were some good things in there. I can't help but wonder if Dixie regrets the final Hulk Hogan segment, because I sure regret watching it.